Okay, we'll start. We'll uh, start sharing the screen basically now. Okay. So uh, basically, um, you know, butterflies actually uh, taught me a lot of things, and the passion for butterflies. Um, started late i was more interested in amphibians and reptiles but butterflies came later on uh, you know when i after i joined bnhs it was um, but butterflies showed me india you know i just started chasing butterflies right from my backyard i landed up ladakh i land, landed up in arunachal pradesh i landed up in andamans i would not seen other butterfly uh, in india if i was not chasing butterflies and that was the best part of butterflies butterflies showed me how we would our country how diverse we are actually we have got so much of diversity plants animals body name it and we have it the kind of habitats we have right from himalayas to to uh, central into to the deserts and we have got the evergreen forest deciduous forest we have got islands underwater life so much so much rich we are actually heritage wise so i'm going to take you a little tour on this kind of chase of butterflies of chasing butterflies across india and you will be surprised i stopped going to foreign countries now because india has got so much to offer so much to see and one lifetime is not enough to see india in one lifetime you have to know and see india it's so vivid and so diverse india is so basically we start with lepidoptera scaly winged insect you are staring at the a moth moon moth with a feathery antenna so basically this antenna is the one that makes a difference between butterflies and moths but actually butterflies and moths belong to one group only they are lepidoptera scaly winged insect if you observe a butterfly wing or a moth wing under a microscope it looks like a roof tiles you know all the roof tiles they are the scales and that is the scales that gives the color and those are and basically main difference if you want to learn about butterfly you know difference between butterflies and moths so let's see whether you can start learning and basically moths are moon worshipers they are most of them are out in the night majority of them but there are several bright color butterflies which are but bright color moths which are out there and they look you might mistake them for butterflies too but you have to look at the antenna you know butterflies always have a hairy antenna with a slight swelling at the tip where moths can have feathery antenna can a hair like antenna but never a swelling at the tip or never a bead at the, or hook at the tip that's the difference between of a butterfly and a moth but for a scientist or a biologist butterflies and moths belong to one group actually lepidoptera there are, there are some of those families there are and they are both in one group that is lepidoptera but basically there is this 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 kind of uh, group groups we have is for layman you know basically to lay people just to understand and you know we are more partial to butterflies and we sometimes uh, biased against moths many times <laughs> because but moths are also very pretty you will be understand they are so diverse and they they are they are senior to butterflies in fact so here are some moths if you see and these are moths and some are very interesting moths but you look at the looks of the moths the looks themselves are different Yeah. Okay. You got it. Yeah. So, uh, friends, uh, the moths look very different. Though some are very colorful and you can mistake them for butterflies, these are the moths, and some look like wasps and some look like bees. And they have to, especially the day flying moths are, you know, they have to, they have to live in the daytime. A lot of birds are active, and birds are the major predators of the moths and butterflies. And they have to look in the garb of wasp and. Uh, Bees because bees they have a nasty reputation. So they fly under the wasp, look like uh, under the garb of a wasp or a or a bee. But the main difference is, of course, is the the antenna. Look at the antenna. This is the antenna of a butterfly, and that is the main difference. Of the, the swelling is very very 
uh, at the tip of the antenna. That's the, and that's the, that's the proboscis called. That's the proboscis. That's where that's the mouth part. You know, they have to. They can't eat solid as such. They they always drink. So always wait, wait water, nectar, or other other fluids. They have to be in fluid form and not in solid form. So that's their mouth part. That's a, like a straw. They can drink everything that comes in a straw. And then they have the antenna. Of course, there are others, other sensory parts also that butterflies can sense. And there sometimes, and they can see one more color which we don't see the ultraviolet. You'll be surprised that the flowers, the yellow flowers you see otherwise, they look yellow. But if you see from a UV viewer, you see a pattern of landing lights. Just like when you're, you're, when you're landing on an airport, you see the landing lights. Even the petals have the landing lights for butterflies and bees to guide towards uh, nectar and towards pollinating. Of course, nectar is a reward for pollinating. It is basically the colors mainly, you know, the butterflies are colors and you'll be surprised that several butterflies don't know the existence of flowers. Though usually we associate flowers and butterflies, butterflies and flowers, but you'll be surprised that some butterflies come on urine, sweat, dung and dead animals, but not on flowers. And that's the requirement, the especially salts and nitrates which they require, is, 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 uh, they require for several reasons. And uh, that they take it from urine, sweat, dung, from animals, bird and even humans. So uh, this is how you uh, find butterflies on dead crab or a dead uh, frog on the road, or but usually majority that's the main energy source. But many of these nectar so lack the nitrates and salts. But the colors actually, what draws them to us is the color. You know, the color of butterflies actually makes them uh, so attractive, and that's why we uh, get attracted. But we'll be surprised that there are two types of colors. One that color is there in the in the in the, in the scales. The scale the scales are covering the wings like the roof tiles. The color is present in the scales itself, but one color is not there. It is structural color. This color doesn't exist. Just you must have seen the you know the, the, the petrol on water in rains you usually see on the road the petrol on the water shines about iridescence of different colors or you see the soap bubbles that kind of color that iridescence. Those are structural colors. Those occur. Those colors occur because of the refraction of light. Similarly, some of the butterfly scales also have this kind of properties or ridges that cut down the wavelengths and refract from the iridescence. That's why you see these colors. They don't exist, but you see. It's an illusion. So some colors are structural, which are illusion color. Illu that's just illusion. And some are actual colors present in the scale. But yes, colors fascinate us, and that's why we are fascinated with butterflies mainly. But the evolution of butterflies is basically with the evolution of flowering plants on this planet. So there were moths beforehand and they were feeding on a lot of uh, non-flowering plants like, uh, like ferns. But later on, the butterflies evolved and with them, uh, a lot of uh, uh, flowering plants also. And you'll be surprised that many of the moths actually don't feed in their adult stage. Can you imagine? You know, especially the atlas moth or tussar silk moth, they don't have stomach, they don't have mouth. You say poor fellow, no, not poor fellow. It's a glutton. When when it's a it's a caterpillar, it's a glutton, and when it uh, uh, it uh, is there, it feeds like a real glutton, and that's in the uh, full month when it's it's, uh, it's uh, living a life of caterpillar. But when it emerges as the adult, it doesn't have stomach and doesn't feel hungry because all the energy it requires, it is it is stored in the body fat, and it has got only eight days of life. Imagine what you can do in eight days. And nature has budgeted his lifestyle. You know, we, how much time we spend in eating? You know, <laughs> how much time we spend in eating? We have breakfast, we have lunch, then we have four o'clock, some, something to eat, then we have night, dinner, and given a chance, we'll wake up in the middle of night also and eat. So, how much time is spent? But that kind of time, these moths don't have the Tatar silk and Atlas moth. And, they, and if they start going for finding food, they'll be they'll exposed to the predators. Raiders might eat them. That's why the females, many of the moths are flightless. They have no, no need to fly. They just stay there. The males will come. Male will risk their lives, but not the female. Excuse me.
Can you hear me now? Okay. Hello. Yes, sir. Now it is fine. Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, that's how the evolution has taken uh, care of some of the but uh, moths. Especially, they have they are, they don't have mouth parts, they don't have stomachs, and they have very brief lifespan. So that their mission is only to find a mate, reproduce, and perish. But butterflies have a longer life lifespan. They they live about something like three to four weeks, and some can live even for an entire year as in hibernation, especially those butterflies which stay in the extreme weather in the Himalayas as well as in deserts. So they can actually hibernate or activate uh, in summer or winter. So that's the additional lifespan they get, sort of bonus. So if you look at the butterfly species all around the year, all over the world, there's something like 1,74,250 species of butterflies or moths. And out of this whole lot of 1,74,000 plus, uh, we have only 18,000 species of butterflies and rest are all moths. So moths are almost 10 times. You know, in India also, we have 10 times more the moths. Like we have butterflies around 1,320 species in India, politically, uh, uh, you know, within Indian boundaries. Whereas the Indian region, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, we have about 15,000 species. You know, if you go to England and you ask them how many species they have, They'll probably say 47 species, sir. You can imagine 47 species they have, and we have got 1,320 species. So much diverse we are. My God, we've got lions, tigers, elephants, so much kind of birds. We have bustards, and we have got floricans, we have got uh, trogons, and we have got flycatchers. You name it. The kind of diversity we have, the orchids we have, the rhododendrons we have, in the, and that kind of, you know, and habitats. It's amazing. So that makes India so rich. And when in English came to India, they were really fascinated with this kind, this kind of diversity. And that's where they studied butterflies and they named also butterflies. And all these people who were posted in India, they were army officers. So obviously, they, uh, they named these butterflies also like commander, commodore, sergeant, sailors, constables. So according to, obviously, the, these ranks were, were, were they were more familiar with, basically. And butterflies are actually, uh, you know, biologists have classified them into six groups. Like, you know, they are swallowtails, skippers, then there are whites and yellows. Those are basically whites and yellows butterflies. And then blues, very tiny blues, small little finger nails. Most of them are blues, not all of them. And there is another group called judies and punches, the judy, plum judy. And then there is another big group called brush-footed butterflies. So let's first get introduced to this group, these different groups, and then we'll proceed further. So let's talk about swallowtails. Swallow bird, of course, you know, birds, swallow birds, and they have often long tails. So some of the butterflies also have long tails on their hind wings, and that's why the name swallow tails have been given, of course, but all butterflies don't, of this group, doesn't have these long tails, like the common jay here, you see, it doesn't have that uh, long tail, but uh, it is also a swallow tail. The group swallow tail, actually, the, the, is, is classified according to the caterpillar i'm sure if you have kadipatta or lemon in your balcony or a terrace you'll see the small caterpillar coming there or bird dropping and then it turns it looks like a bird dropping in the initial stage and then becomes a, a green but uh, caterpillar before it pupates if you try to touch it an orange organ comes from its uh, head and that's the orange organ called osmetarium is present only in swallowtail caterpillars and that's how the entire swallowtail group has been classified even the apollos high up in the himalayas are swallowtails because their caterpillar has got an osmetarium gland. Now we come to skippers. Skippers rather, you know, they are rather uh, dull and drab, and they are more forest dwellers, and uh, they are difficult to identify. Also, a lot of uh, butterfly people uh, sometimes keep away from this group, <laughs> finding it so difficult to identify. But these are usually some of them are flat. You know, they close their wings behind, and some are flat across. They are called flats. And some are like the Indian palm bomb, especially if you have a palm in your garden or your house, is this, this butterfly will dare to come inside your house also and lay eggs. So that's the Indian palm bomb. And then we have these beautiful whites and yellows. You know, you, grass yellow, I'm sure you must have certainly seen them walking on the grass. You sort of flush them. Of course, they are nothing to do with the grass. They don't lay eggs on grasses, they lay eggs on cassia, cassia fistula or Indian laburnum. But they are usually found at the grass level. They don't find they're at a tree level. And that's the grass yellows, very common butterflies. And then you have the common Jezebel, another beautiful butterfly, very attractive to look at, but show it to a bird and the bird will say yuck. Why? Because these are actually warning colors, distasteful. 
they these butterflies to protect themselves because they can't bite they can't sting they can't fight back so they have evolved to use plant poisons to protect themselves and where do you get this poison they can manufacture so what they do is while they're caterpillars they feed on poisonous plants they lay eggs only on poisonous plants only some of them they can not only digest the poison but they can actually uh, retain that poison in their body and when they emerge as an adult that poison is still inside them and when an inexperienced birds and you'll be surprised that many majority birds are insectivores also so not uh, and few birds eat dal chawal so majority they are, are insectivores birds and when in, any, any inexperienced bird goes to go for the slow flying brightly colored butterfly it has a peck ahead moment it comes in contact with the body juices of this butterfly it starts retching because the plant poison starts acting on it and the bird starts retching vomiting it throws out the butterfly and it it hearts start racing it palpit palpitation is very high and it scares away the bird so much so much so that never again it will touch that butterfly it gets a scare of his life but it doesn't kill the predator the, the idea is to teach a lesson teach a lesson to the predator that is very important so you'll be hearing an over voice because there's another session going on the other room so uh, please ignore that <laughs> It's all online ka zamana hai, isili, it's online sessions are going one after the another. So now we come to blues. Blues are those small butterflies as small as the little fingers nails. That's a common cerulean and the common hedge blues. These are found in your gardens also. And you'll be surprised many of the butterflies will not seen in flowers, but they'll be sitting on a bird dropping. You know, they have got affinity for bird dropping, the skippers and the blues, because bird droppings have got nitrates and salts, which they require. I'll tell you why salts are required later on. Then we come to judies and punches. Judies and punches are another beautiful butterfly, but they are shade-loving butterflies. They don't come out in the open in the grassland. They are basically, they look like they lie low undergrowth. You know, butterflies are very fussy. For instance, they are very sensitive. They have their own habitat preferences and they'll stay in their habitat only. If the habitat is lost, they will leave that place. So many a times, even the temperatures, the temperatures vary, suddenly they leave that place. Like I've seen in Corbett National Park, I was there and I saw some butterfly which is supposed to be on the high altitude. But there was a sudden change in temperatures up there, quite cold, and they all came down. And I was surprised to see these butterflies at this small, at lower altitudes, because they had migrated. And next morning, they disappeared. They went back as it warmed up uh, down below and up there also. So they, they went back. So they migrate. And this behavior actually is now used by the climate change scientists, because you can monitor the population, why they're migrating, why they're changing, where are they going. So that has been happening to study the weather changes and this kind of slight changes. Butterflies are very, very sensitive. So here we have the striped punch and plum judy. Plum judies and stripe, especially plum judies will never close their wings. They're slight open, they'll keep the wings slightly open and they always go for the bird droppings or uh, rotten fruits uh, fallen on the garden and they look for the uh, juices of the rotten fruits. And we surprise Butterflies are number one alcoholics. <laughs> of course, they don't go for rum and whiskey. But rotten fruits, actually, when they start rotting, they give out the alcohol. And that attracts a lot of butterflies. In the forest ground, when I had gone to Sikkim, in a place where a lot of fall, fallen fruits were there, and that entire ground was full of butterflies on these fallen fruits. And then we come to the brush-footed butterflies. This is another large group of butterflies. And we have baronet on the right, on the left. And uh, the... The right one is a gaudy baron. I have not written a name on it, but that's called a gaudy baron, a very gaudily colored butterfly. And it lays eggs on the mistletoe, on the parasitic plant that grows on other, other trees. And baronet is a very beautiful, very handsome butterfly found in the central India. As we surely you'll see in Hyderabad now. And it lays eggs on tendu or uh, the bidi patta, you know. And why they're called brush footed butterflies? You know, being a. Vilma, I'm on another... Yep, yep, thank you, thank you. Uh, so basically, these are brush-footed butterflies. And brush-footed butterflies uh, are called because, as insect, all butterflies have six legs. Hmm? And uh, uh, they, these butterflies, usually butterflies walk on si all the six legs, but these group, or this group, the brush footed butterflies walk on only four legs. The four, the front four legs are actually used 
is a short legs and with the brush like uh, legs are there and they use for cleaning their face and antenna that's why they're called brush footed butterfly that's different they're the they're, they're scientific they're called nymphalids Root. don't worry of the of the uh, latin names and uh, just uh, uh, enjoy the butterflies now you see why we have so much diversity look at the map of india it's so colorful it's colorful because we have got 10 biogeographic zones that are different we have got himalayas we've got deserts we've got central uh, uh, deccan plateau we've got western ghats we've got northeast and india that makes india one of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world not all countries are lucky enough to have this kind of diversity so we have that we are so lucky and so rich we are and then we have two hot biodiversity hot spots the northeast and the western ghats are the basically two um, hot spots we have in india and where you have the maximum diversity especially northeast you know out of the 1300 plus butterflies we have 900 are found only in northeast right from sikkim eastwards you go in assam arunachal meghalaya nagaland it's, it's so diverse with butterflies bird insects and i go there every year it's like a mecca for me you know because it's a place to actually see the kind of diversity and the butterflies you see in, in hundreds sometimes when they're, they're mud puddling on the on the river bank the hundreds of them so it's crazy of course we have the western guards also we have certain several endemics found only in that place nowhere in the world those kind of species are found there and they are found about 330 species are found along the western guards and about 900 plus found in the eastern and the rest are found in the rest of india the rest of india of course there, there is good diversity but not as much as these hotspots that's the difference so we start with trans himalaya that is beyond himalayas uh, so we start with ladakh and this is the indus river actually and look at the look at the terrain it's almost treeless it's so hostile but there also butterflies fly and here the here actually i had gone there to see a specific butterfly which flies at about ten thousand feet in that's the time when i was writing my book you know you can usually sit in the library and write book there's so much reference is there on butterflies right from the british times so it's easy to write books sitting in the library bns library is quite rich in that but i said i don't want to write books sitting in the library i want to actually visit the places and actually see the butterflies i want to observe them photograph them write about them and then i'll i want to really see them myself and then I'll write because then it makes a lot of sense in writing about them so that's the reason i started my journey to explore india and see india when i was writing this book it took me really the first book i wrote was took me 10 years to write because exploring india is not simple and uh, this is a somori lake look at the look at the lake and look at the, uh, the panorama it's all dry, dry desert cold desert it's treeless and this is the lake is is not fresh water but a, a, but a uh, brackish water possibly the tithi star you know when, uh, when the tithi star when this is supposed to be the in himalayas or under the sea and sometimes you can get even fossils of shells on the in himalayas and this is a place where all the birds come to breed in fact I could, uh, if you go in July, a lot of lot of these birds like gulls and a lot of migratory birds, a lot of uh, geese, ducks, they come and breed here, and in the in the summer, and they migrate when the, the, the these lakes start freezing, and that's the place uh, you see wildlife also, and that's a that's a, a snow leopard. Of course, I I this photographed in, in the zoo, but just really this is a top predator predator in the that region of Ladakh, not tiger or lion or uh, other leopard, but this is specialized predator adapted to that kind of harsh climate and uh, the kind of habitat and of course you have the camels too but that is a bacterian camel the bacterian camel that possibly mongolian traders brought in or when the alexander came in and these bacterian camels are still there there and people are using it for joy right now but these are double hump camels not a single hump camel you see in uh, rajasthan or uh, gujarat but look at them there's a double hump and there's a desert here that's a nubra desert amazing beautiful desert you have right in the himalayas it's a cold desert but it's a desert of course with the sand everything and the camel too what more <laughs> but yes i i saw this beautiful handsome tibet in wild ass of course you can call it donkey but it's not donkeys where handsome stallions they are very handsome and the speed they run with you can't beat it you know especially if you go to ladakh you will possibly have to stay there in bed for one full day because if you if you as, as soon as you land up in lay and you start going for shopping you'll fall sick you start you end up with nausea throbbing headache and even so you might get so sick that they'll you'll have to go back to delhi immediately so the best way if you go to ladakh one one full day you have to you have to 
uh, spend in the bed and get acclimatized till your body get acclimatized to that 10,000 plus altitude in the rarefied air. And these are, uh, these kyangs are actually, they move at a wind speed. You can imagine. And that's the habitat you see in some of the areas, the grassy meadows like thing. And that's where I was looking for a butter, butter, butterfly called Apollo. And here, the, the blue arrow at the right bottom, that is where I saw this Apollo. And I was crazy. You know, it was my lifetime ambition to see this. I'd never seen it. And in this harsh, very harsh uh, habitat, and with very this kind of low vegetation that grows like a succulents, I could find this. These are the butterflies. The common red Apollo and the regal Apollo. The common red I found at the highest motorable road, Khardungla Pass. That's the highest motorable road in the world, about 19,000 plus. And there it was basking on the road. There in front of me, I was, I was, you know, it took me time to really, oh my God, I'm looking at Apollo, which I have been after so many years. And I went clicking like crazy. That's a red Apollo. And then I found another Apollo also, the regal Apollo. There are several species of Apollos. And every Himalayan peak has a different species or subspecies, you can imagine. Because isolation, these kind of um, uh, subspecies and species are evolved there. They are not able to meet across the peaks. The, the heights are so um, uh, are in, inaccessible for, for mixing of the, um, the species. So they have evolved into different species, on, almost on each peak or each range. So these are the Apollos and Apollos not, they do not come below 10,000 except one blue Apollo I'll show you later which comes around 8,000 feet but otherwise most of the Apollos fly at 10,000 feet above and you can see them only in July, August and bit of September then they go to sleep and they'll wake up next year and as they go, go to sleep not as adults but usually as pupae or caterpillars or eggs but not as adults. Adults will emerge as it warms up. And there are other butterflies also, the whites and yellows. I saw the bath white and cabbage whites. Cabbage whites are very common there. There are Indian cabbage whites and large cabbage whites. You see nilgiris also, the Indian cabbage white. Some of the Himalayan butterflies you see nilgiris also, but few of them. And uh, these are some of the few butterflies which are common in nilgiris, but cabbage whites, but not other whites. These bath whites are found along the Himalayas, all along from Arunachal to Kashmir, into Pakistan, Afghanistan. And then we have the blues here, very tiny butterfly, as small as a little finger's nail, very tiny. But you can find them flying happily at 10,000 feet. And then we had the nymphalids, some of the nymphalids I had never seen before, like the high brown fritlaries flying at 10,000 feet above. And it's a birding time also. You know, I could see the black neck cranes also. I, that was my lifer for me. Black neck cranes, uh, there a pair I saw. And I was really, I'm thrilled to see those black neck cranes there. And that's the time I saw the Ladakh tortoise shell at Khardungla Pass, high above on the Khardungla Pass. And this is very endemic to Ladakh region. That's why the name is Ladakh tortoise shell. Otherwise, there's another tortoise shell called Indian tortoise shell that is found from Kashmir to Arunachal Pradesh. But this is found only in the very narrow region, endemic to that uh, Ladakh lay region. And now we cross over to Himalaya, so the wetter part. Now you see trees, conifers, deodars, ch um, pine, junipers, you know, these kind of trees you see this. Now different, you cross over in the wetter part of Himalayas. And this is Eastern Himalayas. This is, I've taken it from Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary, Arunachal Pradesh. This uh, photograph. And the now the forest is different. You have tall trees, handsome trees, but the leaves are different. They are not broad. They have to sustain the extreme temperatures, cold, extreme cold, extreme heat. Yes, you can get sunburnt in Himalayas. Your nose turning almost black. If you're not using a sun sunscreen properly. And rhododendrons. If you happen to go to Himalayas now, in this season, from April to June, the entire Himalayas are ablaze with these flowers of, of these rhododendrons. It's amazing. And there are several species, more than 50 species of rhododendrons occur in India. And that as you change from mountain range to mountain range, the color changes at places. So those are rhododendrons that flowers in the months, in, the, in this ma April, ma that's the springtime, the flowering time. And of course, you see a lot of familiar flowers also, like the, like the balsam, you see in Western Ghats, you see in Himalayas also. And there are places like Valley of Flowers. Valley of Flowers is not just one place, but there are several Valley of Flowers in Himalayas. And the amazing carpet of flowers you see. And of course, each flower is different. Each flower is tailor-made for a pollinator. There are bat flowers, there are moth flowers, there are bird flowers, there are butterfly flowers. So you, so many people go to Valley of Flowers that they, they see, Oh my God, we saw so many flowers and not a single butterfly. Yes, you'll never see butterflies there because those flowers are, are bee flowers or fly flowers, the open flowers. 
not for butterflies. So butterflies will go for those flowers which are tiny and been bunch. And there are bird flowers, so like, the low end, like the mistletoes. They will not even bloom until the bird pecks at it. So that kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of symbiotic relation is plants and birds and animals in, have, have evolved. And there you have the Himalayan black bear. I'm showing these animals because then you, you associate with these different habitats. And every habitat has got different animals, different plants, different, and then different butterflies. That's the Himalayan bear, not the sloth bear you see in Central India. And there also the butterflies were different, like the snow, snow flat. Though it doesn't occur on snow, but the white patch actually is there because it, it is a habit of sitting in bird droppings. And bird droppings always have a splash of white. And when this butterfly sits on a bird dropping, it mixes, it merges. Optically, it merges and can't be seen by a bird. And bird will not look at his own dropping, first of all. So how it, that's how it escapes been seen. And here's another uh, swift, called a straight swift. Why it is called straight swift? Because this series of spots you see here, they are a straight line. That's why the name straight swift. And these butterflies, the skippers are usually bobs, aces, and swifts uh, usually. And um, they are rather difficult and possibly uh, you can learn from other but common butterflies first and then go into this kind of difficult group of butterflies. And then the other skippers are called darts and hoppers. These are again, and they, some of the hoppers, you know, keep their wings half open always, never flat open. So they're very typical of this group, the skippers. And then we come to swallowtails again. And here's another third Apollo I'm showing you. That's a blue Apollo. Look at it. It's a very handsome Apollo flying at 8,000 feet, not at 10,000. It comes slightly down. And this are found in Great Himalayan National Park. If you happen to go to Kulu Manali, do try to visit Great Himal National Park. Lovely place to trek. The meadows and the kind of birding you do is amazing. And butterflies too. I, I go. I asked to go there. I have not gone there recently, but I've been there for several times. I've been there just for butterflies. And then you have a very handsome butterfly called the yellow swallowtail. Yellow swallowtail is, is very common species found in Europe, in Central uh, uh, Asia, Russia, England, Europe. Also, you see. Very common butterfly. Of course, there are different species and subspecies, but it is called a common yellow uh, swallowtail. Very handsome species. But these are not Paleartic, you know, Europe like. They are not Oriental. As you come down the plains, you'll see the different kind of butterflies. You, this butterfly will not see at lower altitude. So, altitude also makes a change of fauna. Fauna will change according to as you come down, as you go up. We are coming down now. And there I saw these red bodied swallowtails, and they are called windmills. Windmills because they have the long hind wings and they sail slowly, they'll move, and no bird will dare to attack. As I told you, because this beautiful butterflies, actually, the, those are warning colors to keep off the birds from attacking. Birds soon learn to keep off from these butterflies because they harbor plant poisons that gives them a violent nausea and, and vomiting, and never again they'll touch this butterfly. And that's why they, they move very slowly to make sure that the predators don't make any mistake. They look at me, boss. Don't make a mistake. If you try to eat me, you'll spoil your stomach. So that's how the warning is there for these butterflies. And, but that's how butterflies protect themselves. Lovely butterflies. And you see the difference, you know, how to identify butterflies. Look at these white spots here. You see the white spot here, the big spot here, and a small spot below. And here you have a big spot here and a white spot above, the, not below, but above. And there's a below there's another spot. So and they're they're separated. So this kind of placing of the spots on the wings or the markings actually are the key for identification of butterflies. And then we again come to the whites and yellows, and they have the eight black wings, the large butterfly with those veins. The wing veins are darkened by the dark scales. And then you have another common brimstone or the Himalayan brimstone they call. You know, this is a butterfly actually which gave the name butterfly. Because in Europe, you know, the winters are very drab and cold sometimes. So they are looking, they're always waiting for the spring to come. And the first sign of spring is what? This yellow butter color fly flying. This yellow color butterfly is flying. And that's how the butterfly name was coined for this yellow butter colored fly. That's a butterfly. So, and brimstone was a butterfly that possibly gave the name to this group of insects, the butterflies. And of course, you are in Himalayan meadows, not in the pine forest. Or in the other forest, but right in the in the Himal meadow, the grassy plains slopes, and you can see these clouded yellow butterflies, you know, flying non-stop, restlessly they fly across across the grassy meadows, and very difficult to get them unless they wait for a flower or two. These are the grassy uh, clouded yellows, and not the grass yellows. They look like grass yellows, but grass yellows are not found at that altitude. 
We have not yet come across grass yellows and immigrants that you see on the roadside. And then we have this large hedge blues. Like we have the common hedge blues, for, you can find them uh, across in, uh, in you know, garden also, but this large hedge blues found in the Himalayas. And there are other butterflies called the Argus's, which are found in the Himalayas. Don't worry, just to give you an idea what kind of butterflies are found, don't worry about names. And then have some butterflies which are not quite brightly colored. Because they don't stay in forests, not in grasslands, but they stay among the rocks, on the Himalayan rocks. And they have the kind of pattern that breaks their body optically and you can't see them in the, among the rocks. They sit there and they usually feed on fallen fruits, or dead animal or rotting fruits or, or, or maybe uh, some trickle from the rocks. But usually they avoid flowers and usually they're seen in the rocks. That's why they have called the rock browns and other uh, butterflies here. And this satyr has got a habit of you know, basking in a different way. Usually butterflies, you know, they need to bask because they're cold-blooded creatures. So they have to absorb the warmth of the sunlight. And when they, op they open their wings like a, oh, like a solar cooker and to absorb the heat. But this guy, the satyr actually tilts on one side. It doesn't open, but tilts on one side to absorb the heat. That's a very funny, it's a very ex exceptional way of, of basking in the sun. That's only one, this butterfly does that. And then we have the beaks. Beaks you see in Europe also, in Central Asia also, and here in Himalaya also, and you see in South India also. And there are some hills recently, they found here near Mumbai also. So this is basically a hill species. And they are called beaks because their, their mouth parts are slightly pointed, like a beak, bird beak. And this are called beaks. And there is a club beak because look at this. Look at this kind of the, the club-like pattern that gives the name club beak. And then the club is broken here in the common beak. The club is there, but it's broken. That's a common beak. That's how you identify butterfly. The different names are given accordingly. And then we come to another forest, That's a subtropical forest. We are coming down now, with the leaves are getting broadened now. They are not in coniferous forest. Let's see what animals are here. See the red, the red panda. Red panda is very much a tree dweller, a, terrace, a tree dweller, a arboreal creature, not a ground dweller, and stays among the trees. And so it's a state animal of Sikkim. There also you have skippers and butterflies here. You can see the green olet, very, very beautiful, handsome butter, uh, butterfly here. And those flats are getting bigger and bigger here now as you come down. And then you have the sapphires. You, you can see the colors of the sapphires. My God, the blues are so beautiful. And the golden sapphire. You know, you just keep... It is only the male actually who has these bright colors. The female is actually a brown color with orange markings. Females are different and males are different. Many species, some are male and female look alike, you know. So that's the difference. These are sapphires and these are all structural colors. And they are as small as your little finger's nail. You know, at most you look like picking them for airing. Beautiful, pretty airing. And then we come to other nymphalids. That's the eastern courtier. The male is on the left and female is on the right. Female is very, very shy and resist, you know, always uh, found in the dense forest where the host plants are there, where she usually lays her eggs. And she has got, she can taste with her feet. You know, butterflies taste with their feet. And she keeps on touching the leaves to see the fine right plant and there she lays the eggs. Some butterflies lay eggs in large batches of five to 10 together. And some butterflies lay only one egg at a time. And then we have this very handsome, Butterfly called a large silver stripe. And then we have beautiful another Indian purple emperor. Purple emperor is one, it keeps on changing the angles of the wings and you see different hues of blues, just as it changes. So these are structural colors, again. And then we come to Ranganga, Ramganga River in Corbett National Park. We are in Corbett National Park and that's a Ramganga River. Then we are now the foothills of Himalayas. And the forest is different now. And we have the Gharial. Gharial is the uh, fish eating crocodile. We have got three crocodiles in India. We have got the saltwater crocodile in Sundarbans, you can see it. And then we have in Odisha, you can see it. And then we have the Gang uh, in Ganges and cent Central India and upwards, you see the Gharial. And South India, usually, or other places also, you see the Magar, the smaller crocodile we have, the freshwater crocodile. And elephants, now you see. You, you can't see elephants up there, but now as you come down, you see elephants. Because elephants require huge forest, contiguous, huge forest. Because the elephants also, if you stay at one place, they'll destroy. So they keep on flying. Uh, keep on moving and the migrating is very important. So if the roots are blocked, it is actually harmful to the forest because elephants should not stay in one place. And elephants are the one who actually plant the forest with the eat the plant seeds and that's how the with the droppings the seeds are 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 are, are actually dispersed. So these are the gardeners who, who plant the forest, the birds and the animals. Now imagine who has planted people uh, or banyan tree on the top of the building or a bridge. That's a bat or a bird. 
many of these are specialized seeds that has had a, that has to go in the gut of a bird or a bat and unless it gets the, the condition of an of an acid uh, treatment from the of the gut it will not germinate also so that's how the plants have designed itself so to land up at different places and get dispersed from the mother plant and now this is a tarai typical tarai with the silk cotton and other broad leaf leaves on the we are on the, the tarai region tarai is the basic on the on the foothills of himalayas especially you see in dudwa national park and you see uh, in uh, assam area up tarai typical and there's you have the golden langur now we are in northeast and this is a recently as recently as 1957 this uh, beautiful langur was, was discovered by epg who was one of uh, a british planter and conservationist and that's why his latin name also has been given in his uh, honor and the rhino of course rhino is a mascot of the northeast and these are the animals are the flagship animals you know the presence and absence of the animals actually tell the health of the habitat you know they'll not be found everywhere like in maharashtra we don't have like maharashtra we don't have elephants why because not that somebody has killed them the forest is not rich enough to support elephants so elephant don't want to come there is below that they, they can't survive in those and we don't have tiger in mumbai is not that we have got forest we got leopards here but not tiger tiger is very fussy very specialized animals so but but leopards can survive on frogs and rats also so it has survived in mumbai so that's a rhino wonder and rhino endangered and specially protected in places like kaziranga and other places and now translocated to dudwa also so we have this very endangered animals still surviving india and then north is, is a land of orchids you know of course orchids are found in the western ghats also south india but majority orchids are found in north the variety diversity is more in the northeast and april may is best time to see the orchids in the forest and there are some special shows in sikkim especially in may i have been to gangtok and there was a special exhibition of orchids there and amazing to see in orchids in sikkim and darjeeling areas and that's the forest you know northeast this is in arunachal actually namnafa national park and the forest is so beautiful and dense and the cloud just descend among the cloud it's an amazing place you know india has got some of the best forests in the world like you know uh, especially in the northeast and then we have the western ghats some of the forests we have and the central indian forests also are different and there you have hornbills of course hornbills require the kind of forest which they don't lay eggs on the tree like crows nest make nest like on the tree but they make nest inside the tree so they require big trees old trees where they can go inside and make their nest so the presence of such creatures and birds are important to indicate the health of the forest and this is the reeth hornbill so this was in northeast northeast there are several other varieties also brown uh, hornbill is there and great indian hornbill is there uh, plenty of uh, other uh, kind of amazing variety you see in and a lot of people from outside india they come to india to watch birds because we the diversity we have a few countries have that kind of diversity and the butterflies too you have the all king the all king has got a habit of sitting under the leaf So you have to keep on lifting the leaf and quite slowly to photograph this. That's what I photographed this. Then we have this great swift, and these spots actually, the white spots here actually, the placing of these white spots, you know, actually tell you how to identify the butterfly. These spots here, the kind of spots here, and kind of two spots here, whether they're together or they're joined or not, or one spot missing or one spot here. So these are as the keys to identify these butterflies. This is how we identify butterflies. It's a slow process, even. Um, even i am here for last so many years working butterflies but even i make mistakes is it's it's i am always, always a learner never a expert i would say and then we come to dragon tails that's a white dragon tail on the left and then we have the green dragon dragon tail on the right the green dragon tail is a greenish patch on the wing and the wing border the four wing the black border is uniform it doesn't broaden at the apex here you see on the left the wing border actually broadens at the tip and here it is almost equal so that's the difference between and this greenish band is on the green dragon tail and this is the white dragon tail and these are so beautiful dainty little butterflies you'll mistake it for drag dragon flies but they are not dragon flies they are dragon tails found only in the northeast forest and then we have very endangered butterfly called the bhutan glory is found in arunachal pradesh meghalaya and recently i was in zero that's in arunachal pradesh and there you see kaisere hens bhutan glory yellow gorgon brown gorgon amazing place because i don't have a photograph of bhuta uh, kaisere hen here but kaisere hen is one of the rare of the rarest butterflies found in the northeast and is protected as much as lions and tigers on the and wildlife protection act even butterflies are protected under wildlife protection act just like lions and tigers and here is another beautiful butterfly called the 
five bars of this five bars one two three four five bars here on this this is the cell region and these are the five black bars and that's why it is called five bar and here's a sword on the hind wing that's why it's called five bar sword tail that's how the butterflies are named and this butterfly five bar is found in down south also south of maharashtra you can see them and then again you can see them in the northeast and then you have another group of uh, Portals, the Wayne J. These are all the names I said that they were given by the English officers who were posted here, and that's how they are. They studied. They, that's something they studied also seriously, and they named them also. Today also we are using those names which the Britishers gave, and they are used world over in the Northeast and the South East Asia, and the world over. These common names are coined, and we are using them so that uniformity is maintained to know what is what. The com this is the English sword tail and the Wayne J, and then that's a bird wing butterfly. Bird wings are large butterflies. And the largest butterfly in India is the southern bird wing that is found in the Western Ghats, not in Northeast but Western Ghats. In Northeast, there are two bird wings: one the golden bird wing and common bird wing. The difference between common bird wing and, and uh, golden bird wing is the male has got a slight black dusting. You see the border of the wing here, hind wing, is a black dusting here. That black dusting is present only on the golden bird wing. That's how we. Uh, Identify the butterflies, and that's how the identification key is there. So, identifying butterfly is a slow process, but yes, if you are interested, if you're slightly crazy, you certainly pick it up. And bird wings, the male is much smaller, the female are larger and much darker. Also, that's the female here on the right, left is the male. And then we come to Jezebel and Soth Tooths. Jezebel are very pretty butterflies to look at, but birds keep off, as, as I told you, they are warning colors. These butterflies are distasteful, they don't kill the prey predators, but they actually teach them a lesson to keep off by having poisonous uh, you know uh, toxic uh, chemicals in their in their body that they are derived from their plant food host plant while they were caterpillars so that plant poison is used to deter all the pred predation and then we have some butterflies which actually uh, the saw tooths you know saw tooths are not actually uh, distasteful but what they do they mimic like jezebel they look like jezebel and birds mistake them for Jezebels and they also are left untouched. So in butterflies, a lot of mimicry happens. Some butterflies are not able to adapt to digest poisons, but they were, they were evolved to look like each other and they get, get protected because they look like a distasteful butterflies. That's how the sawtooths look. They belong to the same group of whites and yellows, but they are different butterfly species. And then we come to blues here. These are the silver lines. Look at the silver line. Very pretty mark. And there's a silver line between these um, stripes. You can see that there's a silver line is here. And that actually is uh, what it makes uh, the name silver line. And then we have the punches and judies here. You can see the uh, judies and punches, stripe one. That is the, those are the punches and judies, you see. And ma majority of judies and punches are in the northeast. In South India, you've got only two species of judies. One is the state judy and one is the plum judy. And that's, I showed you the judy in the starting. That's the usual brownish um, uh, red butterfly that is found am among the undergrowth, never on the open grassland. And these are the uh, silver line butterflies. Silver lines are very typical and they have false head and false antenna. It's to divert the predator's attention towards the less vulnerable part of the body. You know, sar salamat to pagdi pachas. You have to save your head. How do you save your head? To have a decoy head. So they have a decoy head at the end, and that's how they protect themselves with the decoy head. This is a this is a decoy head. You see, here's a decoy head, and uh, that's how they protect. And it's a false antenna, false head. And when we approach this butterfly, they move these hind wings to to attract their attention. That if you want to hit or attack, attack me here. You know, it, it provokes you towards a less vulnerable part of the body. And as such, the life of butterflies is between three to four weeks, and that after that, they're they're dispensable. So. So here we have the long banded silver line because of this uh, band central. There's a central band here actually, which uh, which shows you. Uh, sorry, it gets the cursor doesn't show me. So otherwise, the central band here, which uh, uh, actually gives the name of the, of the the long central band on the, on the wing. It's got long band, and here actually there's a club like pattern on this uh, silver line that gives the name club silver line now we come to the nymphalids nymphalids are again the crows you know you must have seen crow butterflies the brown and dark crows here but they are not as 
attractive as the crows you see in the northeast. They are beautiful. When they open the wing, the azure blues. Different kinds of hues of blues you see. And there are palm flies which lay eggs on the palm, uh, palm and uh, cane. There's a, and there's a Jezebel palm fly also. She, the Jezebel palm fly actually tries to look like a Jezebel, brightly colored, which is not distasteful, but the Jezebel distasteful. So birds also keep off from the Jezebel palm fly, mistaking for a Jezebel. That's how the mimicry happens. And then we have some butterflies which live in the dark, dense forest. And you have to really enter into leech infested areas. You know, whenever you go to Arunachal Pradesh or Northeast, we wear the leech guards right up to your thighs up there. And so that the leech don't catch you. Because there are leeches everywhere. The, the forest is wet. Leeches are waiting for you, for a warm little creature to come near. And that's where you have to look out for leeches. But to find these butterflies, you have to enter the dark forest. And some butterflies will stay right inside dark forest. And you will not see them unless they fly. And you see the flash of blue suddenly, like you have the jungle glory, the flash of blue. And then you again, it goes back and settles some of the dry leaves to become a brown and disappears. Then you have the beautiful striped ringlet. Another beautiful butterfly, you see the, the ring of blue, uh, the the ring of blues here, uh, rings, eye spots, and that mixes the beautiful butterfly, the striped ringlet. And now we come to from Arunachal Pradesh, we're coming from Northeast, we're coming down to the to Sundarbans. And another beautiful forest area, we have about 40% of Sundarbans are with us, the 60 are with, we share with Bangladesh. And there, of course, you travel in boats, you can't walk there. The, the tigers are different there, and it's not like uh, you can't. You are not allowed to walk. In fact, in, there are places somewhere you can walk where they have put nets. You have to walk inside the nets, well protected. And yes, I saw tiger there also. You know, I went almost seven eight times, and finally I could spot the tiger. Then of course, this tiger was after a deer, which was it was stalking, and it was it was it almost got the deer, but this time the deer was lucky and deer escaped. Of course, it's not every time the tiger is successful, and this time the uh, deer escaped, and possibly the tiger has to work for his breakfast. But of course, I was after another tiger, not this tiger. I came all the way for to see not this tiger. This tiger can see in Tadoba also. But I was after this tiger, the white tiger. That's a butterfly which is found only in Sundarban mangroves and in Odisha. The two places I can see this butterfly is very endemic to the mangrove areas and not anywhere else in India. And finally, I found this butterfly in Sundarbans. That's a white tiger. And as I told you, when I was writing a book, I actually wanted to see this book butterflies actually watch watch them flying doing their things so i can write the book it's not just sitting in the library and then write a book it's no fun so here i saw another species which i had not seen before and sundarbans there of course you have the saltwater crocodiles watching you and you know that's the only place where you can actually 10 feet and see this huge crocodiles more than 25 20 feet uh, huge crocodiles watching you and very harmless while you're in boat otherwise they are quite formidable and you see the largest monitor in India. This is the largest monitor we have in India. That's a, that's a wireless salvator or the water monitor. We have got the desert monitor also. We have got the other common monitor. But this is, and the yellow monitor we have, but this is the water monitor. Is You can mistake it for a crocodile, but it, it is very swift and can climb trees also, can swim also, and eat birds, eggs, whatever it can overcome it eats. And then it's a good place for birds also, actually. With the brown wing kingfishers, and there are several species of kingfishers you see there. But that place is a wetland full of full of fishes also. That's a colored kingfisher. And if nothing else, you can see the crabs, the fiddler crabs. That's how I watched them when I had nothing else to see. The crabs, you know, trying to establish territories in the low tide. And the, the stronger ones who, who, who drive away the weaker ones in the holes and to establish the territory. That's the males, the very long claw, the fiddler crab, crab or the calling crab they're called. And the large craw is basically to drive uh, to fight the small claw is for eating and then from the east we come to the west that's a uh, desert of rajasthan and let's see in this desert what you find you know india is so diverse you know amazing the diversity we have you come to this end and this and everything the, the flora changes the fauna changes the, the landscape changes is amazing so we have the arabs here in the, in the in the desert obviously desert should have arabs and we have arabs here and that's a large salmon arab salmon karab Color, color, the salmon color you see, that's a large salmon Arab. And you have the small orange tips. You have got a small Arab also, white Arab also, and a blue spotted Arab also here in Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, and Punjab we share with Pakistan and then down south. And these are found not only in Rajasthan and UP and Gujarat, but all the dry areas in Andhra Pradesh, Tamil, also they are found where the dry areas are there. And then we come to the land of the tiger. 
that's a sal forest tall sal forest you have lovely uh, tall termite mounds you see here and that's where you have the tiger and nowhere else in the world you can see tiger at 10 feet you know people have killed their tigers in malaysia thailand in malaysia they kill the tigers they eaten up so in india where you have see tiger in open gypsy like this nowhere in the world and that trade goes to our forest department they have really made this possible and today tiger is a big business is not just tiger you know while it's a very huge mega business with so much hotels so much of people working so much livelihood that depends on tiger so tiger is going to be there because it's just not wildlife but it's, it's a mega business animal now today and that's only in india it happens nowhere else and of course there's a good lot of birds to watch and you'll be surprised that majority birds are insectivorous and eat other than grains a lot all birds are eat they don't eat dal chawal normally when you find a young bird in your garden you try to feed with dal chawal don't first identify the birds find out what it eats what what species it is not eat what it prefers and feed it accordingly eat give them a boiled egg a small piece of boiled egg or some other thing but not dal chawal because some are totally non vegetarians and you see this this lot of butterflies huddled together they are on the huddle huddled on a wet patch why because these are all males and what they are doing they are collecting salts salt for what the salts that dissolved in the soil are taken by the these males and collected and they are going to pass it to the female the female needs it to make her eggs viable when they mate they, they are going to pass the eggs to the female uh, the uh, sperms and the salts to the female and that makes the eggs viable and female will going to choose only the saltiest guy the male who is the saltiest will be chosen that's why these males are all fighting show, you know pushing each other fluttering with wings fluttering and trying to get as much salt as they can so that they, he becomes an eligible bachelor and now we come to the western ghats you know western ghats is a very unique ecosystem the hills and the mountains and that's where the when the the the, the rain laden crowds come these are the mountains that stop the rain laden mountain that makes the konkan region and the and the western coast wet the wettest part during this season and the rest of the part of the india is slightly dry of course the central india with hyderabad comes or other places so because of the rains are stopped here by this system and these are the catchment area where the rivers are born so we don't require this forest and mountains for animals and birds but more for us for our future because this is what uses the fresh water and fresh water is this, makes the civilization successful without fresh water we will lose ourselves we we'll lose our civilizations so this is what we want to preserve this forests and mountains for not for birds and butterflies only for us for our future and there we have this uh, giant squirrel which is a state animal of maharashtra and the prince of the jungle of course today also you come to mumbai you'll see you're likely to see a leopard there in right in our national park because that has survived very tenaciously either eating even crabs and frogs or rats if not deer because that is not fussy tiger has left because tiger was fussy very specialist so and the forest is not good enough for tiger but this prince has survived in the jungle in the concrete jungle survived surrounding this forest and of course this is another tiger called a striped tiger of course found in hyderabad also i found him nizam pet where we were working on the lake there we were trying to revive this dying lake and finally we succeeded in doing that that's a place you can now also go to nizam pet lake there and you can see this beautiful butterflies there because we have planted special plants around the lake to attract birds and butterflies and the water is there to attract a lot of aquatic birds also so that's a striped tiger you can see all around india and you have the largest butterfly that's found in south india the largest butterfly is found in south india that's a southern bird wing and that is a female that female is about 180 mm and is found from south southern maharashtra onwards up to kerala and bit of tamil nadu on the western ghats a very specialist and and among the the forest also it's found and sometimes it comes uh, under degraded forest also but it's basically a south india and found only in the south india and we have a bird wings common bird wing golden bird wing in the north india northeast that's those are different species and then we have the smallest butterfly also the small grass jewel this butterfly is as small as a little finger nail you know this little finger nail is as small almost 12 mm to 14 mm that makes the smallest butterfly in india and of course we have commander here you know i told you these butterflies were all actually named by the british officers who was who was stationed here in the british times and they named them commodores commanders sergeants constables that kind of names you have in butterflies 
and these names are still used all over the world and we have some endemics some of the beautiful gorgeous endemics in south india and in western ghats some of the beautiful butterflies found in the western ghats are amazing and they are endemic because they are found nowhere else in the world only in western ghats this is the malabar banded peacock very beautiful butterfly we we'll just keep on watching it you know i was in um, at samilan shetty's butterfly meet where we uh, had a good meeting there and i spent almost an hour just photographing this butterfly it is so beautiful you know you just don't know want to take your eyes off on the beauty it's so beautiful it's crazy but it's true and then we you go forest south of maharashtra goa you see this beautiful large butterfly called the malabar tree nymph it floats in the air like a plastic you might mistake it for a plastic paper but no you don't have plastic paper in the forest but this is a butterfly called a malabar tree nymph very beautiful butterfly found only in the western ghats there is another tree nymph found in the andamans and in sundarbans but that's uh, in andamans which is you can see in the mount harit national park and in sundarbans you might see but it's very rare in sundarbans but here malabar tree nymph is sure to find in good forest of go and karnataka and kerala and now we come to andamans islands you know we have islands amazing places the forest is on the land and there is a forest below the sea also lovely coral fishes and amazing life and the water is crystal clear like a blue glass amazing clear glass and snorkeling is so wonderful there of course where we are i was there for a different reason i was looking for a butterfly that is found only in andamans that is the andaman sort tail endemic to me and i want to photograph it for my, for my book and i found it i was lucky i searched everywhere and i, I was very lucky because i had only just few days left and i had to find this butterfly in andamans and i found it you know this butterfly looks like a five bar sorbet but because of isolation on island for hundred thousands of years it has evolved into different species the andaman sorbet and it is endangered and endemic another species was the andaman club tail so that's also found in the andamans on the mount harriet again a species that is found only in andamans and nicobar and some of the birds and butterflies found there are found nowhere else in the world they are endemic to those area only like the andaman teal is found there the little small duck is found there in andamans and the painted jezebel painted jezebel found here also in the andhra pradesh and odisha and northeast but uh, it was found in andamans also and then in the most difficult part for butterflies survive is to when they pupate they have to stay in one place good that's the time a lot of birds are active so how to remain invisible so you disguise so here's a disguise you see there's a it looks like a, almost like a, a twig up there but that's a pupa of a mime butterfly and the actual twig is below so that's how it it remains uh, hidden and invisible under guys and some of course don't disguise but they actually advertise their presence because they have distasteful poisonous content in, in inside their bodies and birds will never dare to attack this brightly colored pupa because they know if you try take a bite you'll have a bad stomach and bad pal heart pal palpitation that's good enough to scare them off and some butterfly caterpillar just stay inside the leaf the fleshy leaves of calenchio like the red piero will be not seen from upper side or under side but remain hidden inside and some can you spot the butterfly caterpillar here sitting right there on the mango leaf and with this kind of ground hugging body shape and pattern with with no shadows it almost invisible no shadows meet not seen that's how some of the army buildings are devised very ground hugging Uh, army uh, buildings because no shadows means no you can't be seen that's the same principle here no shadows can't be seen and the, there is a yellow band also on the top of the caterpillar that it itself aligns with that midrib who told it to align itself but it's a behavior that is that is evolved out of selection and this is how they survive in the daytime a lot of hungry birds are around and this this is another classic example of how nature sculpts it has sculpted this butterfly so perfectly that it looks like exact like leaf So this butterfly if it is chased by a bird it flies off it flies into showing the blue orange blue orange blue orange and then again it closes the wings and becomes a dry leaf on the dry leaves and the bird is still looking for a blue color butterfly you can't see the blue because it closed the wings it has disappeared here i am here i am not simple but it works and then you have the silver line here again silver line with this kind of uh, silver line i have still long band silver line that comes start from here and there and here you have a decoy this is a decoy actually that it's a false head and a false antenna the real head is this side and then but you have a false head which is very bright and to try to try it tries to attract the predator's attention to the less vulnerable part of the body 
सो दैट्स हाउ द सर सलामत तो पगड़ी पचास दैट्स हाउ द स्ट्रेटेजी वर्क्स फॉर डाइवर्टिंग द प्रेडर्स अटेंशन and then we have the false eyes here you know predators are usually programmed to attack the eye region first to dispatch the prey immediately when the prey can strike back so that's where the eye is and you have the false eyes for the target so you, this is how the butterfly fools the predators to strike at the at the extreme end of the wings so even losing bits of this wing bits doesn't affect the butterfly but if i can still survive it's 3 to 4 weeks doesn't matter that's how the butterflies evolved to have this kind of Eye spots along the wing edge, and that's the evening brown butterfly. Common evening brown. It comes in the houses also, in light also. It flies in the evening. Usually, butterflies fly in the daytime, but this is the evening flyer. But of course, butterfly life is not simple. You know, it has got its own tensions, and you have the lizards waiting, or a frog waiting, a tree frog, toad in the forest, or there's a specialized wasp who catches the caterpillar, inject with the venom, paralyze the caterpillar, take it to the nest, and stuff them to feed their own babies. So. it's not easy to be a butterfly and there are specialized uh parasitic wasp they inject the eggs inside a caterpillar's body and this babies or the wasp live inside a caterpillar's body not killing the caterpillar keeping it alive till all of them emerge and pupate outside the caterpillar body like you see here here on this left side top they all the pupae the white pupae on the caterpillar's body but then this the bottom it shows the i was talking about the osmeter in the gland which is solitary caterpillars have that's a bright red organ whenever there is a wasp attack this caterpillar it pops up its organ of orange osmeterium comes out and it gives a very strong repellent smell that's the first insecticide invented by insect repel the wasp attack and it works that's osmeterium only the solitary butterflies have uh, this osmeterium on the back of their head this is osmeterium and then spiders too keep the butterfly population at check this is a giant wood spider the female and they have the huge nest some birds also sometimes small birds can get trapped but butterflies also get trapped in that and birds of course the black neck monarch or the specialized but look at the bills they are not green eating birds they are they are specialized in secreting birds and they are very important in your garden or farm land to keep the pest species down and you have tickles um uh fly catchers like this and you know this kind of different kind of fly catchers and bird are specialized in insect feeders so those are very important uh, you know to show the health of the forest you if you they are visiting your garden that means garden is healthy but healthy balance of of insects bird population and plant population but the the worst part is losing the habitat you know most of the animals are suffering because habitats are lost big when the big dams are coming or maybe some of the large areas of forest are diverted for other purpose the entire forest which is very vital and some forests are very irreversible that is very important we have to assess this that when we want to do some development to do it but not the cost of the forest actually see the the value of the forest what is the ecological value of the forest assess them properly and do it but we don't do it for the short time greed and that is the drawback because india has been very rich in this biodiversity and that is our wealth if we lose that we will end up like other countries this is the wealth which we have to and this is a system that supplies us the fresh air the good fresh water of the river system the forests that cleans up our air and provides resources also so we have to maintain this this is because this is our wealth and not just our but for the coming generation also but of course butterfly is a crazy hobby if you are a butterfly when you see a butterfly you have to just throw yourself on the ground you can just stand out and photograph not like that for butterfly you have to go in the world go down and waterfalls are very very productive especially if you are traveling northeast or in western ghats go where the waterfalls are there and you can see plenty of butterflies there and you can see butterflying is actually going in the world going in the muck rolling in the muck photographing them at eye level be a butterfly to photograph a butterfly that's a success and but very popular we have a lot of butterfly gardens coming up like we have in mumbai olekar garden people come every sunday throng there with, with mobile cameras with other small cameras or large cameras they come there and on the top right we have uh, youngsters at the butterfly meet at zero in arunachal pradesh people from all over india came from south india they came and different places they came and then we have people photographing at the top uh, for the bottom right, uh, left is the people in assam photographing a butterfly all youngsters you know and this butterfly meet now we just don't show beautiful butterfly and share beautiful photos we are now our job is to guide these people these youngsters into right path of taking butterflies as a vehicle to study nature conserve nature and protect nature 
that's why we they we advise them how they can do the studies like masters or phd's on nature conservation how they can take conservation as a profession so that is very important and that's what we do at the butterfly meet to to guide our next generation into getting into the business of conservation wildlife conservation and, and that's very serious business and the, the, need, the need of the hour and that's why we have to protect this planet with and, and this is and we are part of this web of life we are not alone here the birds butterflies all there and the system while the butterflies are flying around and the birds are singing around you that means all is well and you are part of this healthy web but if you don't hear them or don't see them that means something is wrong and and we are possibly the next so thank you friends that was my uh, talk and if you have any questions you can uh, still um, uh, ask me questions and i am there here to ask Thank you, Isaac, for that. Thank fantastic you, thank you, thank talk. you. Thank you so much, and the, the photographs of the butterflies are just simply amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you so much. I am glad okay, that I finally guys. made. You know, I had promised you in October that I'll be coming to Hyderabad and <laughs> we'll talk. And finally, okay, today also you. I messed it almost. <laughs> the talk actually got into in between, and another talk is actually going in the next room. As long as you came in and talked to us, that's perfectly okay. All is well that ends well. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks for Thank joining so this uh, talk. And now it's open for question answer session. Yeah, sure, sure. Whoever sure. wants to ask a question, please switch on your video. In fact, yes. everybody can switch on their videos and raise your hand. I will take your names one by one, and we'll take your questions one by one. Sure, so sure. Directly ask Isaac. Isaac would like to see who's asking him. Sorry. No, I was saying Isaac would like to see who is asking yeah. him the question. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. So you can switch off your switch on your videos. Feel free. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No you can switch on. I can. Uh, I, Everybody. I can see you also. No issues. You can all. You can <laughs> see who all came in to your talk. Yeah. First question, please. Who would like to go? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Raj Shekhar. Yeah, he wants to ask. Yeah. Look, sir, I'm also like life member of BNHS. Uh, oh, that's and good. I'm, uh, Deccan Bird as member, life member since long. Right. So I met you at uh, just uh, the, the photograph book, which was out of, uh, which was co-signed by Asad Rahmani sir. Then oh, I yeah. met you in Bombay uh, okay. four years back. Okay, so great. So my quick question is: so which are uh, which butterflies are uh, listed in Indian Forest Act 1990? Uh, Actually, uh, basically some of the butterflies like uh, Kaiser Hind are there, Bhutan Glory. You know, we have different schedules of, uh, in wildlife act, the different schedule, schedule 1, schedule 2, schedule 3, schedule 4. So, uh, Bhutan Glory, Kaiser Hin, Dragon Tails, and some of the endemic butterflies which are found only in the Northeast. Some endemic butterflies like we have in uh, Western Ghats, like Malabar, uh, Banded Peacock, and Tree Nymph. They are all protected uh, under schedule 1, but there are other schedule 2 also are there, schedule 3 also are there. So, but some are which are endemic and found nowhere else in the World, they are get the maximum protection, so they are protected. But Kaiser Hind and Bhutan Glory is the topmost, and they are on the red data list also, uh, in the, of the IUCN. Yeah. Yes, sir. I got my. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And even Danid fly Crimson Rose is also under Schedule One, sir. Yeah, actually, that is little uh, a mistake. Actually, the Crimson Rose is, you know, possibly I don't know how by mistake it crept in, and there have been uh, it hasn't pointed out it should not be. But uh, it has been pointed out, but this Danadic flag possibly that uh, even mime, you know, common mime is also protected. But that common mime race is there. Yes. The race which is found only in the northeast, not the common mime we find in the gardens, but a race. And the Danadic flag, I don't know why uh, they were uh, listed as, as uh, protected, which is very strange. And there have been demand to actually revise this list, which has not been happening, possibly. Yeah, possibly with the earlier references were taken with wrong references. So that is a possible. And butterflies were given the scant attention also. Their more attention was given to the larger, bigger animals and mammals and birds. So possibly it'll, this will take some time to, to correct this. Yeah. Yes. You're right, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> Have a nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I've been wanting to give a presentation, but somehow, uh, you know, I think this uh, one hour is not sufficient for you. That time, <laughs> time with you. <laughs> yes, right. Great photo. Farida, you had a question. Farida? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like, uh, hi, Isaac. This is Farida Sampal. I'm with the WWF. Hi, 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 hi. hi. How are you? Hi. Good. I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah. In fact, I was going to tell you about WWF. Actually, I did my first book on butterflies with WWF. Actually. 
Yeah, that yes, was my first book on butterflies. Uh, actually, it was a small That's booklet good. on butterflies of Western Ghats by Thomas Gay. And WWF right. came to me and they said, Why, can, can you rewrite this book? So I said, yeah, yes. this is too small and we'll rewrite. And there was this small chapter on how to catch okay. butterflies and how to kill butterflies in that book. I said, WWF can't publish a book on killing and catching butterflies. So let's replace this chapter because right. he's a, you know Thomas Gay was a Britisher. Obviously, he wrote like that. Right. So we replaced with photographing butterflies, gardening with butterflies. So that was my... Right. So I owe WWF that. I started butterfly series writing with WWF first, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so for your asking. Yeah. yeah. So uh, though I'm not from the state, I'm of course originally from Mumbai only. Oh, great. Uh, and a uh, student of Parvish Pandey and all that. Uh, right. About, uh, when I've been working here in the Eastern Ghats and the Sandhu Pradesh Telangana patch, uh, the generic name for butterfly here is just Sita Kuka Chiluka. Ah, and I was wondering yeah. if we can also start developing local names for the yes, butterflies. Yes, would it you be can. okay or would we be doing a text? No, actually you can. You can, you, you, you can do actually. Maharashtra, we have done it. In Maharashtra, okay. we have right. done the local names. We have got a list of Mah Marathi names. You know, what we did was we got hold of the butterfly people around the state and made them uh, 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 star, you know, assembling names and we did a uh, entire uh, Marathi name for uh, our butterflies here. Yes, we have done that. You can do with your biodiversity board also, or even WWF can do that yourself. Okay, all you right. You can make it popular that, and make a that. group, yeah, of butterflies, of butterfly enthusiasts of uh, your state, and do it. Yes, you can do it. Why not? It's a yeah, good idea. Sure. That's the best way to popularize it. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, that's okay. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, yes, yes. Ramji Nagarajan has a question. Yes. Ramji yes. Nagarajan had raised his hand. Ah, uh, what is it? Tell me. Ramji Nagarajan. Yeah, please. Is he okay, there? He raised his hand, but he's Achha, not. Never, never mind. You can ask next one, possibly. Anybody yeah. else wants to ask. Yeah. Next one, please. Anyone yes. has a question? <laughs> Yes, yes, Kirti, yeah. And Chitra also wants to there, yeah. Chitra has a question. Chitra Shankar. Yeah, okay, okay. Entomologist. Yes, Chitra, yes. Sorry, yeah, I can hear you, Chitra. Ask Chitra. I can't you, hear. You are on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah perfect. Well, Wonderful yeah. presentation. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Just like we have Merlin app for uh, birds, uh, is there a possibility of developing an app for butterfly identification? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can actually. We have one, but we have already developed one actually. It's called the eye butterfly. You can, you can actually, it's for Android platform, uh, download it also. So what we have done is we have, we have, uh, we have selected uh, 60 butterflies uh, uh, common in all cities of, of India. And it is available free uh, for download. It's an offline app. And you can do it for that. Like birds also, it was done uh, for identification. So this uh, Accenture people actually had approached us to do that butterfly app also. But uh, somehow it has not worked out. But butterfly work, they're still not uh, perfected the butterfly bird app actually. They could uh, they could get some, but still it is, is it's in the making. So they haven't uh, done the for butterflies yet. But I think that's a good idea. Maybe somebody should work on this butterfly also. Yeah, yeah. That's a good uh, idea. What I was thinking was if we can have something like eBird with uh, some all spot, uh, you know, observations getting into it and then the images co are collateral. Yeah, 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 right, right. Then it would be a great thing. I yes, think. yes. That can be, that, that is what is wanting. Yeah, possibly eBirds, like eBirds, we can have a, that kind of uh, yeah. platform where we can share our uh, observations. Yes, we need that. We haven't started yet. There's a butterfly conservation platform is there internationally in the UK uh, uh, and US, but we don't have anything in India. Maybe we can yeah. possibly start there. Or a platform where people can possibly have this kind of platform to share their information on different fauna. Yeah, yeah and including so, butterflies also. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, 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 please, please, yeah. Which do you think is the most endangered butterfly, Kaiseri Hind, or uh, anything? Actually, else? Kaiser Hind is endangered because uh, I even to, till today I have not seen it. I've been to Arunachal twice, uh, wow. to uh, zero, then uh, Namda I went nearly seven eight times. Sikkim I have gone to nearly seven eight times, and Nagaland I, I to northeast extensively, but uh, northeast I had gone to Eagle Nest also. I couldn't see Kaiser Hind. 
Western Hindis was rare. Whereas Bhutan glory, I have seen it. People have photographed it. Also. But photographing recently, we got a photo of Kaiser Hind in zero. Otherwise, is only very selected pockets. And the best place to see Kaiser Hind is in zero, Arunachal Pradesh. Okay. But that's also I went there, but I couldn't see it. So that's possibly the rare of the rarest. Kaiser Hind. So do, don't we have any conservation uh, thing for that the kind of? Yeah, yeah, they are having now plans habitat? to conserve conservation plans. There's a there's an entire sanctuary there, the Tale Wildlife Sanctuary is there, where this butterfly is found. So that area is protected. Only thing that you can't see in that numbers, you know, it's, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. There's some, they're very, very fussy about the habitat, very sensitive about habitat. So they will always have in that small numbers, unfortunately. Yes. Gunjali has a question. Gunjali uh, Latu has a question. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Please ask. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi, hi, sir. I'm a last year veterinary student from Mumbai. I'm okay. first of all a big fan of yours. Thank so you. I had this question. Uh, do all the species of butterflies perform the process of muddling? Oh, sorry, puddling. Mud puddling. Mud, no, not all. Not yeah. all, actually. Yeah. Surprisingly, uh, many species don't come for mud puddling, but I'm not sure how they transfer if, if there is a requirement for salt. Because this mud puddling is basically of taking salts and that is transferred to the female with the mating. So how other species work on, we really don't know the biology that whether they need the salt or they don't need the salt. Maybe some species do need the salt. And especially some of the nymphalids actually need salts for their muscles also because they are high flying, very speed. And there's a, there are papers, uh, scientific papers on this kind of um, coming for dead animals, for crabs, on dead animal carcasses. Why they come there? That that uh, research has been done, and that is required by this high fast flying butterflies for high speed actually for the muscles. So that's why they do this kind of mud puddling. But not all species don't do that. You're right. So Ramji Nagarajan, you have yeah, a question? Yeah, Ramji, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Ramji, yes. Uh, hello, sir. It was a wonderful hello. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tell me. Hello, uh, just to you know, I'm working these days as a teacher. Okay. Uh, would like to know when these butterfly camps that you post are being held, how do we get to know about okay. uh, me and my... Right. Actually, butterfly camps, um, as from I Nature Watch, we are not really holding any butterfly camps. Earlier, I asked at BNHS, maybe, the Bombay National Society, possibly, will be holding the butterfly camps in any any camp that is going in the Northeast, especially, you know, especially Arunachal Pradesh, Namdafa, that's a butterfly camp, actually. So, you can join that for uh, the uh, BNH is holding those camps and I Nature Watch we hold actually butterfly workshops and we have online uh, courses now we have got online courses on butterflies for beginners so starting from uh, this June we are jo joining again starting so these courses are available you can see on the Facebook also on the website also BNH of the I Nature Watch so we have got online courses on butterflies yes but camps yes Camps, uh, we have not INHR, but BNHS does those camps. So you can check out with BNHS but, uh, website. They do that. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank but you know, you can me. join the, you know, there are Facebook groups are there. Facebook groups actually, you know, uh, like there are about 30 Facebook groups. But these Facebook groups actually hold these butterfly meets. Yeah, so I do. You can join in these camps. So anybody who's interested in butterfly, you don't have a special qualification, anybody. It is just, um, it is just, uh, that you are a butterfly lover or you just want to know. So you can join any of this Facebook. Like we have this butterfly of Northeast, very active. So recently, this March, I was in Arunachal Pradesh with this Northeast butterfly group. And they were they were holding this camp and people from South India, they came, Calcutta, everywhere they came. It was a good time. Thank you, sir. Preksha. Thanks a lot. Preksha has a question. Please, Preksha. Yeah. Preksha is yeah. not... Um, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Anybody I else? Somebody else wanted to uh, catch? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so wonderful talk, sir. I'm a Thank complete you. amateur. And so you. I wanted to understand, do you have any ideas on how to make um, nature in general much more palatable and interesting for kids? So maybe for the kids. And stuff like that. Yeah. Do you, or, or is there like some sort of personality trait that people of only those characteristics get attracted to yeah, actually kids are always curious actually you know for kids you know they, they don't have any hang-ups like us we have a lot of hang-ups we they're not squeamish also you know we they will touch our earthworm also you will not touch but the kids will touch the earthworm so they have they're the best way to catch them young and anything interesting will will catch their attention and that's the best way to teach them actually like 
my parents actually and i i encourage parents actually to to give them into healthy hobbies like photography i was when i was in 8th standard my father gave me a camera since 8th mm-hmm. standard i have now not left my camera i've been photography so i encourage uh, parents to to give healthy hobbies to their kids and give them options because there are so many options around good bad ugly so give them healthy options and mm-hmm. it's a it's a parents op, uh, way to do and nature hobbies are always healthy hobbies like bird watching is there butterfly is there you can go for just gardening also or or something uh, for plants so also people go for plant watching also or even just trekking also it's all healthy hobbies so this is what you can do that and children are always open and they got no inhibitions and best way to catch them young yeah and they are more receptive <laughs> actually and very very you will be surprised the kind of kids now we have a online course on butterflies and we had one young girl 10 years old and we were reluctant to uh, to admit her He said, "No, no, she is so small. We can't admit her. This all, yeah, all older people are there. How we can admit a ten-year-old? But now this girl turns to be most the brightest of all, and she writes blogs also. Imagine, and wow. she held a small workshop online for the small kids of the wow. caterpillar she's of the caterpillar she's rearing in the small bottle, and she held a workshop for the kids. And she's ten-year-old, yeah. Man, I was <laughs> amazed. So this is a good example. The kids, in fact, are more. They don't have any inhibitions. They're open, and they given a chance. But of course." parents are very you know the role of parents is very important to guide this kid to right direction and pay attention and give them the right options yes gautam did you have a question gautam yeah gautam yeah gautam ask yeah, yeah we have few questions from the chat i'm just reading it out uh, sir yeah yeah sure uh, a question from samir is the caterpillar stage a learning phase for the butterflies does it remember predator attacks it had encounter in the caterpillar stage sorry sorry can, can you repeat that i yeah uh, is the caterpillar stage a learning phase for the butterfly hmm does it remember predator attacks it had encountered in the caterpillar stage ah uh, no 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 actually these are two different stages at all they they don't actually you know there is no learning as such and basically uh, in butterfly also there is not learning it is more instinctive it's basically there is no learning like they don't learn as such like we learn with mistakes or they are basically instinctive responses many times and they are programmed like that that way like migration like butterfly you know migrate like every monsoon one blue mormon comes to mumbai it comes from the hills the hills is raining very heavily and then it comes to mumbai to avoid the rains and then after four months it goes back but what goes back it not the same butterfly that came here it is the third or fourth generation after that the the fourth generation butterfly goes back now who told that fourth generation to go back from where his, his grandfather was born or grandmother was born so that is instinctive program built in program so there is no learning in it nobody has to teach him ki baba you go here you go there you don't go here it is not learning it is instinctive program so caterpillar has its own learning like caterpillar will attack the spider will come back or it will fall down and play dead so that's all instinctive it's all programmed so this is there is no learning it's all program their so intelligence is not that high to learn yeah they are not uh, yeah okay uh, one question from sagarika yeah. uh, i would like to ask a question please does the yeah. hemelia patent uh, bush Sorry? flower bush uh hamelia uh, patent hamelia patients yeah 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 uh, patient sorry uh, yeah hamelia patients yeah it's a for, is it uh, orange flowers you get yeah with the tube like flowers yeah i know that yeah. it's okay. a butterfly bush okay called uh, haldi kumkum flower i believe haldi kumkum really? is different that is actually yeah, yeah yeah that's a blood okay. flower blood flower okay. yeah okay do they really attract butterflies yes yes they yes have... in my garden i have in my window sill i have not at night now i showed my butterfly garden i have butterfly garden in my window sill and i planted the blood flower it attracts the plain tiger to lay eggs on it and butterflies come for the nectar also and i have got arislochia which the crimson rose has come and laid eggs and now got got caterpillars and then common rose has come laid eggs and then i got kadi patta the common mormon has come and laid eggs on my plant and lemon so i have my butterfly garden right in my window sill and it's very good to watch it yes okay. nice sir so just i have a you can attract you know butterflies and birds in your window sill and morning when i have chai all the statue tarpet all the jamaican blue spike with blue flowers the sunbirds come in the morning and they, when i have my chai the sunbirds come and sing i have a lovely start of the day and then by 10 o'clock when i'm at home the butterflies come on the same flowers for nectar so that's okay. amazing right from the window i watch this now in the lockdown i watch all this from my window yeah okay. <laughs> yes 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 simha yes, had a question yes, yes, please simha your question please sorry hello myself yeah yeah Kirti Simha. Yeah. 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 Please. 
Kirti ji is the meeting, I think. Yeah. Uh, initial publication as a wild flower, sir. Do you have any idea about revising what, it? What? 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 Sorry? Do you have that as a wild flower? Huh. Wild flowers, sorry. I didn't get your I didn't get your question, sir. Sir, you have written one book. Ah, yeah, book wild flowers. Yeah, yeah, common Indian wild flowers. Yeah, yeah. Indian wild flowers. The great book it is actually. Thank Do you, thank you, sir. The idea to maximize the number of. Species? Ah, yeah, yeah. What happened actually? That book I wrote in between actually. You know, I was writing my butterfly book, and butterfly book took me ten years actually to write. And in between, I wrote this book because butterfly actually taught me botany. See, I have done my graduation in political science and psychology. Nothing to do with botany, but butterflies taught me botany. Actually, you'd be surprised. I know, like you, uh, like you are uh, common Mormon will lay eggs on only curry patta and lemon. You ask a botanist what is common in this? There is a rutaceae family, and butterfly common Mormon will lay only on rutaceae family plants or family curry patta and lemon. So I learned my botany from the butterflies. And while doing this butterfly book, I did my uh, wildflower book because I started learning botany so much. And the fascination grew for wildflowers. But of course, I have not planned to. Uh, I wanted to expand it. But somehow I got carried away with butterflies only, so it got left out with those uh, 240 species only. Yes, but yes, someday I should write it to expand. Yes, thank you. Kirti, can you go now? Kirti Simha. Ikkum ten pole, ikkum sendu ramamblam kilo aruvurva aruvurva. Ipara marthalandu prasha porishtu andurva. Ipara porishtu andurva. Yes, Kirti. Yes, Kirti. Hi, Kirti. Hi, sir. I would know. If butterflies are territorial, they show yeah. nature in the sense when because I see them coming back to the same position, right? Like, sometimes, yeah. so do, is it to protect themselves from the same species? I mean, same uh, hmm. you know, social members, or is it of some other protective? Is it a is they actually they are very the males, you know, males are very, very territorial. The males, you know, especially Danad fly. And great egg fly and some pansies butterflies are so territorial that they, the males will patrol the area. Even the co crow butterfly will take out his brush of pheromones and will spray this, you know, sort of disperse the pheromones to move around to tell other males, keep off, boss, this is my territory. And some butterflies, like I was in Himachal Pradesh, and one butterfly, the blue admiral, even we put a small blue uh, paper, the butterfly chased the paper also. So right. they are quite aggressive in their, their own way. They don't attack in a sense, they don't bite each other, but they, they dash each other, right. that process. So males especially are very, very territorial. Just like any other male, like even the uh, tiger or any other male who are territorial, the males are very territorial. Yes, they, they guard the territory. Only basically for mating rights, nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah, one question from Samir from the chats. Okay. okay. And the yeah. reading here, what are the yeah. factors deciding choice of the host plant for a butterfly? If a species has available multiple host plants in a geographic location. Yeah, right. Actually, you'll be surprised that, you know, a choice of host plants actually very, it's, it's a evolutionary process. They're tailor-made for each other. They have made their choices that you can't change it. Like uh, Kadipatta. Kadipatta is uh, Muraya Konegi. But the Kamini, Kamini also is Muraya. But it will not lay on Kamini. It lay eggs only in Kadipatta. Another thing is that uh, the even the host plants have got toxic chemicals. So butterflies will lay not lay on all plants of same species. They will see the weaker plant, which has got less resistance. Like uh, some of the plants are very, very toxic. So some plants which are not in sunlight or some are very small saplings. So butterfly female will choose those weaker plants to lay their eggs because then the caterpillar can tackle the plant poisons. When the plants are fighting back, you know, okay. that toxicity, each, every plant has got its own toxic element. So that they also fight back. So then the female actually tastes the, you know, touching the leaf, she gets to know the chemical content of the caterpillar, the, the host plant. And accordingly, she will choose the host plants to lay their eggs. And not on, even the species is same, but they will not lay on every leaf or every plant. Only on those uh, areas where the, uh, the resistance, chemical resistance is less, accordingly chooses. And they choose their own like, own species, like uh, uh, common Mormon will lay eggs on, on, on rutaceae plant. Then common immigrant will lay only on cassias. Cassia of different species, only on cassia. Then uh, the grass demon will lay on uh, turmeric and ginger plant, ginger is, ginger is. So this, the families will differ from each species 
of butterflies. Yeah. They, and you find a caterpillar, take it home and you open a fridge and try to feed it cauliflower or coriander. They'll not eat. They'll die of starvation, but they'll not eat that. So it, they're so specific. They can die of poisoning by eating coriander. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's all. <laughs> so one question was, from Pagarika from the chats. Uh, yeah. Primarily, it seems like red, orange, yellow flowers attract butterflies. Yeah. Does color have anything to do with the attraction? Yeah, yeah. Colors, this is real. Red colors, they do get, they see the red color and they see again the ultraviolet. They see the ultraviolet. So many of the patterns on the petals you don't see, but they see it. And there's some landing lights, actually, just like you approach the airport when you're landing, the landing lights. Similarly, the petals also have landing lights and accordingly guides the butterflies. And then, as I told you, there are, there are, there are moth flowers, bird flowers, fly flowers, bat flowers. So, every flower is not like sun, sunflower, they'll not come on sunflower, they'll not come on roses, they'll not come on chrysanthemums, mm -hmm. butterflies. They'll come on axora because there are a bunch of flowers, pentas, they'll come on that. But not on uh, chrysanthemums and jasmines, they'll not come on jasmines. So they're nice uh, fragrant, but they'll not come. So jasmine is a night blooming flower, actually, white flower. So it is a moth flower or a bat flower, but not a butterfly flower. So I told you when I was in Valley of Flower, not a single butterfly in those Valley of Flowers. Because those flowers are bee flowers, open flowers, and not butterfly flowers. So these are made for each other, tailor made for each other, butterflies and flowers, or, or insects and flowers, yeah, or pollinators like the other. Every every flower has got a, a pollinator. Like the mistletoe is is pollinated by a sunbird or a flower picker. Unless and until it pecks the flower, the flower will not bloom. And the seeds are dispersed by the flower pickers. So that is very important, a very close relation they have. Yeah. Okay. One question from Divya. Uh, do we have butterfly or moth that mimic each other? Uh, yes, they do. They do. Like one but uh, moth, especially we saw uh, the day flying moth in the in northeast we saw. Ecocopia Eco, moth. It's very black with the red body and it mimics the red bodied swallowtails. All these uh, bat wings and bird wing, uh, bat wings and uh, windmills are not eaten by birds. And there's this black moth with a red body and looks like these butterflies and they mimic each other. And then we have one butterfly, one moth here in South India also. That is the uh, blue tiger moth. It looks like a blue tiger and it flies in the daytime. It is not a night flyer. It flies the daytime like butterflies and flies among the butterflies and looks like a blue tiger. A blue tiger is not eaten by birds. They're distasteful. And this moth also is distasteful. And it is not eaten by birds. So that's how it helps. So the mimicry is one is also a uh, lot of distasteful species also mimic each other. So that is called ring mimicry. Okay. What happens is any a member is eaten, the other members get protected. Any member of this look look like ring is there. You also look like me, me also look like so you either of us can be eaten. But the, if I am eaten, then you are protected that way. So you will not be eaten yes, oh. that way. So that is called ring mimicry. Yeah. Very interesting, sir. Yeah. Um, we have one more <laughs> question from M. Divya. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are many butterflies are into hibernation, given the fact that it has a small lifespan? Yeah, actually, uh, butterflies hibernate, but mainly in the extreme climate, like in Himalayas, where the, the climate is very much ex extreme and they don't migrate anywhere else. Like some other uh, butterflies which find Hyderabad or Mumbai, they need to know not activate or, migrate or uh, uh, hibernate. Because they move to other places, hospitable places, moist places in a dry season, or they go to other places where they can lay eggs and they can still survive in the other dry season. But whereas in Himalayas, they can't migrate, so they estivate or in dry dry areas, they, they hibernate. In, in Sorry, in cold areas, they hibernate and dry, they estivate. So that's only extreme climate. In deserts, they do that. And in high altitude, they do that. Yeah, they do that. Because it's totally frozen. The entire ground is frozen. Some do migrate down below like like uh, common the Indian cabbage white migrates to Delhi almost or sometimes to Chandigarh and Punjab and then goes back after the winter is over and some don't come back they stay there as pupa and they 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 hibernate they don't come back and they hibernate go to sleep in the winter and when it warms up they come out of the pupa and they start flying so that's the, that's how they do that they they my hibernate in the pupal stage yeah. okay and a few questions from Viva. Uh, they are called skipper because of the way it moves. Yeah, right. It's skipping flight. Yeah, the skippers they are called skipping skipping flights. So they're bobbing and skipping. They are called skippers. Yeah, very fast. Skip from flower to flower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one second. Yes, sir. Those are the questions from. Okay, great. Yeah. 
So that's good. Is anybody so, else would uh, like to ask? Yeah. Anyone else has a question? Kirti seems to have a question. Kirti. May I have? May I have asked one question? Yeah, sure, 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 Shubha. Yeah, I had really nice presentation and Thank you. I liked it because. Ah, Shubha is from Mumbai, boy. A <laughs> purana friend. She is a purana friend. <laughs> and what I liked is that you didn't start with the uh, the means how the butterflies are and what is the um, their uh, what you say. Uh, body and then uh, antenna. Ah, because I didn't want to give a zoology lecture, you know. I and don't want to give, I don't want to take you to... covered from Himalayas to south. That was very nice. Yeah, I have yeah. one question. Now, yeah. common Mormon will um, is a host plant is a Rutaceae family plants from Rutaceae family. Yeah, correct, correct. So if there is a Rutaceae family one, suppose uh, uh, Karipatta and mm -hmm. Bale, then mm -hmm. uh, is there any choice? Yeah, yeah, ch choice is there. Choice is there. Yes, which because I was telling the resistance, you know, chemical resistance in the plants. You know, plants also don't give up. They also are fighting back to ward off the attacks. So the chemical contents of these will vary from kadipatta to bale and to lemon. So given a chance, they will go to the less resistant plant, that is kadipatta, if possible. And kadipatta that is growing in the shade, not in the sun. It'll 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 prefer the plant which is weaker and has a less chemical resistance. So the plants growing in the sun will have the maximum resistance. So they'll avoid those plants, strong plants. And they'll go for the weaker plants of Kadipatta. But chemically also, Kadipatta is more favorable than bale or lemon. So they prefer Kadipatta. Yeah, that okay. So that the female you. will decide. When she, when she touches the leaves with the four uh, feet, she will get to know the actual chemical content. Immediately she analyzes and she decides whether to, I should invest or not. Yeah. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, welcome. So Kirti, did you have a question? Your your mic, your mic. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So my question, it's yeah. more like a question that I want to correct if it is wrong. Yeah. So yeah. You, when you answer questions, you were mentioning that they choose particularly a plant which is less uh, in strength or... Yeah, something. weaker, yeah. Weaker plants, yeah. So, uh, when, because earlier my observation was that butterflies help in pollinating the plants. Yeah, and yeah. They share a symbiotic relationship. Right, right, right. But when you mentioned this, I was thinking that at one stage they also have a parasitic uh, relationship with the plants. Yes, yes, of course. Can it's like you know, yeah, correct. Because you know, they they help they, they help in pollinating. That is, but when it comes to eating your like somebody guest is coming and you know uh, is uh, staying at you, you'll feed him nicely. But he starts taking your uh, you know your money or he tries to move your laptop with him. You'll not like it, right? So that's the difference between butterfly coming and having a sip of uh, nectar and and but the nectar is not free. It's a service charge that service incentive that a butterfly gets for pollinating. It's an incentive and nectar is not free. It's only available when the pollination takes place. Otherwise, nectar is withdrawn. It's not available. It's not pukat ka nahi milega. Mehnat karna padta hai. And then basically, uh, this eating of when the uh, caterpillar wants to eat the plant, the plant will not like it. It is resisting always. Yes, it, there are two different things. Yeah, okay. because that plant suffers in that process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I think Isaac, that's about it. Thank you, Thank you. so Thank much. You. It's been a fantastic Thank you. Thank you. talk. And I'm happy for you because you have been trying it so, yes. and I, have, I, I was know, sorry, so but I was unable to find some uh, proper slot. I'm so sorry that's about that. Shame. No, 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 that's okay. So guys, <laughs> well, I'm happy that uh, I had promised you uh, and I was unable to keep you. it. So I wanted to... Oh, it was, it was on top of my mind. I'm feeling guilty about it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you kept the promise half an hour late, but that has been fantastic. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so and, much. Uh, thank and you, everyone nice weekend. else. This is a webinar organized by uh, Deccan Birders. Okay. We have invited Isaac to come and speak oh, to great. us. Please find us on bsap.in. You'll you'll see you'll look at our website and know what what all activities we do. We do mainly the Asian waterfowl census, yes. and uh, we are proud to conduct that every year. And we conduct a lot of bird watching trips in and out of Hyderabad, within Hyderabad, and also outstation rest of the okay. states. And uh, we uh, we look forward to having you once again on sure, board. Sure, sure, sure. When I'm in Hyderabad, I'll be webinars lined up. Yes, Thank yes, you, yes. Isaac. We'll see you Thank in you. the next three years in Hyderabad. Yes, I'll Thank be there. You, I'll be there in Nizam Pet. Yeah, I'll be there in Nizam ah, yes. We'll do a bird, bird watching and birding also there and butterflies also. Thank you.
Yes, you must come join us for bird yes, watching. Sure, 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 ma'am. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Thank Good you, night. Guys. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Yes. Thanks for joining. Bye, bye. Welcome, welcome. Bye, Chitra. Bye. Bye, Gautam. Bye, Sonika. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Bye, Kirti. Anita.